Throughout history, corrupt politicians who had long exploited their positions of power for personal gain have been brought to justice. These politicians, whose actions eroded public trust and tarnished the integrity of democracy, now find themselves sentenced to spend the rest of their lives behind bars. Join us today as we dive into the gripping narrative of how these once influential figures finally faced the consequences of their egregious actions and ended up in prison. Charles Taylor. Charles MacArthur. Gan K. Taylor was a Liberian politician whose life took a dark turn, leading to his conviction as a war criminal and a lifetime behind bars. Taylor served as the 22nd president of Liberia from August 2, 1997, until his resignation on August 11, 2003, amid the Second Liberian Civil War and mounting international pressure. Taylor's journey to infamy began in Arthington, Monserrato County, Liberia. He later pursued higher education at Bentley College in the United States. Upon returning to Liberia, Taylor initially worked in the government of Samuel Doe. However, his involvement in embezzlement led to his removal and imprisonment by President Doe. Taylor's escape from prison in 1989 marked the start of a tumultuous chapter in Liberian history. After his escape, Taylor found refuge in Libya, where he received guerrilla warfare training. In 1989, he returned to Liberia, leading a Libyan-backed rebel group called the National Patriotic Front of Liberia, igniting the first Liberian civil war from 1989 to 1996. Following the execution execution of President Doe, Taylor gained control of a significant portion of the country, becoming one of Africa's most notorious warlords. Amidst a backdrop of violence and chaos, Taylor eventually won the 1997 general election and assumed the presidency. However, his rule was marred by allegations of war crimes and crimes against humanity due to his involvement in the Sierra Leone Civil War that took place from 1991 to 2002. Opposition to his government grew, leading to the outbreak of the Second Liberian Civil War. By 2003, Taylor had lost control of much of Liberia's territory and was formally indicted by the special court for Sierra Leone. Under mounting international pressure, he resigned and went into exile in Nigeria. In 2006, Liberia's newly elected president, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, requested Taylor's extradition. He was detained by UN authorities in Sierra Leone and later held at the penitentiary institution Hoglanden in The Hague, awaiting trial by the special court. In April 2012, Taylor was found guilty on all 11 charges, including terror, murder, and rape. He was subsequently sentenced to 50 years in prison. Throughout his life, Taylor's actions wreaked havoc in Liberia and Sierra Leone, causing untold suffering to countless individuals. But in 2012, he was finally apprehended for his actions. Fu Zhenghua. Fu Zhenghua, a former Chinese politician and public security officer, has faced a dramatic downfall, resulting in a suspended death sentence. Born on March 13, 1955 in Luan County, Hebei, Fu's career spanned decades within the Chinese Communist Party and law enforcement. Fu's early life and education led him to graduate from Peking University in March 1955. His political journey commenced in December 1970, culminating in his official membership in the Chinese Communist Party in September 1973. During his career, Fu played significant roles in law enforcement, particularly in the Beijing police. He became known for his involvement in solving high-profile cases, such as the 1996 Beijing cash truck robbery case, 1997 Bai Baoshan case, and the Huang Guangyu case. In January 2010, Fu was appointed as the secretary of the Beijing Municipal Public Security Bureau and later assumed the position of director, essentially becoming the chief of police in Beijing. He continued in this role until August 2013, when he he was promoted to Deputy Minister of Public Security, whose tenure was marked by notable actions. In May 2010, he ordered the closure of the Tian Shang Renjian nightclub, receiving a positive public response. He also launched various campaigns against illegal activities, including the 2013 Special Campaign Against Network Illegal Crimes and the 2014 Anti-Vice Operation. Furthermore, Fu's involvement extended to the Central Political and Legal Affairs Commission, where he served since December 2014. Notably, in September 2015, he was appointed as the head of the 610 office, responsible for overseeing the suppression of Falun Gong. In March 2018, Fu took on the role of Minister of Justice, which he held for two years. However, Fu Zhenghua's career took a dramatic turn when, in October 2021, the Central Commission for Discipline Inspection initiated an investigation into him for serious violations of discipline and national laws. This marked the beginning of his downfall. On March 31, 2022, Fu was expelled from the Chinese Communist Party 
Party and removed from public office. Subsequently, on April 21st, he was arrested by the Supreme People's Procuratorate. His trial took place on July 28th at the Intermediate People's Court of Changchun, where he faced charges of bribery and bending the law for personal gain. The prosecution accused Fu of using his official authority to benefit others in business operations, official positions, and legal cases in exchange for accepting money and gifts worth 117 million yuan, approximately 16.76 million US dollars. As a result, he was handed a suspended death sentence, which will be commuted to life imprisonment after two years, with no possibility of parole. Additionally, Fu was deprived of political rights for life, and all his properties were confiscated. Fu Zhenghua's conviction was part of a broader crackdown on officials in the lead-up to a key Communist Party Congress, where President Xi Jinping is expected to consolidate his power. Fu was not only accused of corruption, but also of disloyalty to President Xi, along with other officials who were part of a political circle led by Sun Lijun. This series of convictions sends a clear message to party members and officials, emphasizing the consequences of disloyalty or corruption as China's leadership prepares for significant political events. Despite years of anti-corruption efforts, the highest levels of the Chinese Communist Party are still addressing issues of corruption and loyalty among its ranks. Bo Silai. Bo Silai, a Chinese politician born in 1949, had a prominent political career that ended in a life sentence for bribery and embezzlement. Bo was the son of former Chinese Vice Premier Bo Yibo, and he had a unique image in Chinese politics, known for his charisma. Bo Silai experienced a significant rise and fall in his political career. He initially served in various government positions, aiming to reach higher national office. In Chongqing, he introduced the Chongqing model, a mix of social and economic policies meant to address modern China's challenges. This model involved involved more state control and a focus on socialist ideals, attracting support from Chinese new leftists who were critical of economic reforms and rising inequality. Bo's leadership in Chongqing raised his national and international profile, making him a potential candidate for top leadership. However, his bold governing style drew both praise and criticism. He initiated a campaign against organized crime called Da He, which led to thousands of arrests, but also faced allegations of violating the rule of law and using questionable methods. Bo also launched a red culture movement to revive Maoist-era socialist values and implemented social policies to reduce wealth disparities. His economic policies aimed to attract foreign investment, stimulate urbanization, and maintain high GDP growth. Despite his popularity among certain groups, Bo's leadership style was divisive. He was known for his authoritarian approach, often intimidating subordinates and stifling dissent. His downfall began when his police chief, Wang Lijun, sought asylum in the U.S. consulate and revealed evidence implicating Bo's family in a murder case of a British businessman. In 2012, Bo Xilai was removed from his high-ranking government positions, including party secretary of Chongqing, due to serious allegations of corruption, and his involvement in a scandal surrounding his wife, Gu Kai Lai, who was linked to the death of a British businessman named Neil Haywood. Bo's removal from office triggered strong reactions across China. Supporters of Bo, particularly from leftist groups, expressed anger and accused his dismissal of being a conspiracy against the state. They believed Bo was unfairly targeted. On the other hand, liberal media praised his removal, criticizing his authoritarian style of leadership and dangerous policies. Subsequently, Bo faced a high-profile trial in 2013. Bo primarily faced three charges, bribery, abuse of power, and embezzlement. Prosecutors alleged that he received approximately 21.79 million yuan, equivalent to 3.56 million U.S. dollars, in bribes from businessmen Xu Ming and Tang Xiaolin. During the trial, Xu Ming testified that he gave Gu Kai Lai three $3.23 million in 2000 to purchase the Fontaine Saint-Georges Villa in Nice, France, and also covered expenses like Bo Guagua's travel and credit card bills. Bo vehemently denied the charges against him, including bribery and abuse of power. However, the court found him guilty on all counts and sentenced him to life imprisonment and is currently incarcerated at Qincheng Prison. Sun Zheng Kai Sun Zheng Kai was a former prominent Chinese politician who faced a dramatic downfall marked by corruption, expulsion from the Communist Party, and a life sentence in prison. Born into a farming family in Shandong province in 1963, Sun Zheng Kai's early life was far from the political spotlight. He embarked on an academic journey, obtaining degrees in agronomy and eventually climbing the ranks within academic and political circles. Sun joined the Chinese Communist Party in 1988 and began his political career. His trajectory was remarkable. With 
with significant roles in various regions, including Beijing and Jilin province. By 2006, at the age of 43, he became the Minister of Agriculture, one of the youngest state council ministers at the time. His career was on a fast track. In 2012, Sun's fortunes took a significant turn. He was appointed as the party secretary of Chongqing, a strategically important position in Chinese politics. This move was indicative of his potential for even higher office, signaling the trust placed in him by the central leadership. Chongqing, however, had its share of political turbulence, and Sun's tenure faced challenges related to the fallout from the Bo Xilai Wang Lijun incident. As Sun worked to stabilize Chongqing's political scene, his star appeared to rise. Speculation grew that he had earned the endorsement of President Xi Jinping. But in early 2017, the Central Commission for Discipline Inspection released a report critical of Chongqing's political leadership under Sun's watch. This marked the beginning of his downfall. By July 2017, Sun was abruptly removed from his post as the party secretary of Chongqing and replaced by Chen Minner. The transition was swift and signaled a grim fate for Sun, who was conspicuously absent from the handover ceremony. Shortly thereafter, the Central Commission for Discipline Inspection announced an investigation into Sun's alleged violations of party discipline. This marked a significant event, as he became the first sitting Politburo member to be investigated since Xi Jinping's rise to power. Sun's political career was effectively over. The investigation revealed a laundry list of misconduct. Sun was accused of wavering in his beliefs, violating political discipline and rules, engaging in corruption, and even money for sex transactions. While not explicitly stating that he accepted bribes, the investigation found evidence of criminal wrongdoing, leading to his expulsion from the Communist Party. In the aftermath of his expulsion, party organizations in Region Sun had previously led rallied to declare their support for the decision. Sun's political influence had crumbled entirely. In February 2018, Sun faced bribery charges, pleaded guilty to corruption in April, and was sentenced to life imprisonment in May. His crimes included accepting bribes worth 170 million won, about $26.7 million. This marked a significant chapter in President Xi Jinping's anti-corruption campaign, which has punished over a million officials. While this campaign aimed to combat corruption, critics argued that it served as a tool to eliminate political rivals and maintain President Xi's hold on power. Larry Householder Larry Lee Householder is a former American politician who found himself entangled in Ohio's largest bribery corruption scandal, leading to his conviction and a substantial 20-year prison sentence. Householder was a member of the Republican Party and had a political career marked by yups and downs, culminating in his involvement in a massive bribery conspiracy. Born in Zanesville, Ohio, Householder grew up working on his family's farm in Junction City. He later pursued higher education at Ohio University, where he earned a degree in political science. Married with five children, Householder initially ran an insurance agency and served as Perry County Commissioner before entering the realm of state politics. Householder's political journey began when he ran for Ohio's 78th House District in 1996, challenging incumbent Democrat Mary Abel. He secured victory and was re-elected three times, eventually becoming the Speaker of the Ohio House of Representatives in 2001. During his tenure, he led significant legislative reforms, including concealed carry, tort reform, and defunding Planned Parenthood, making Ohio the first state to do so. However, his career faced turbulence in 2004 when he and his advisors were investigated for alleged money laundering and campaign irregularities. The case was closed without charges, but Householder was term limited in 2004. He later served as the Perry County Auditor. In 2016, the Householder made a political comeback, winning his old seat, now District 72, after redistricting, and was elected as Ohio House Speaker once again in 2019 with bipartisan support. However, his political career took a dark turn in 2020. Householder's downfall began on July 21, 2020, when he and four others were arrested by the FBI in connection with a massive bribery case involving a $60 million scheme related to the financial rescue of First Energy's nuclear plants in Ohio. U.S. Attorney David M. DeVillers described it as one of Ohio's most significant bribery schemes. Money from First Energy was funneled through a fake nonprofit organization to pay bribes and evade campaign finance laws. In response to Householder's arrest, Republican Governor Mike DeWine called for his resignation. Householder, however, refused to step down. The Ohio House of Representatives took matters into their own hands and unanimously removed Householder as Ohio House Speaker on July 30, 2020. Despite being expelled from his position in the Ohio House of Representatives in June 2021, Householder continued to face legal consequences. In March 2023, he was convicted of racketeering in relation to the first energy scheme. Then, on June 29, 2023, Householder Holder was sentenced to a maximum of 20 years in prison for his crimes. Vital Kameri. 
Next on the list, we have Vital Kamerhi, a prominent Congolese politician who has had a tumultuous career marked by both significant political roles and legal controversies. Born on March 4, 1959, in Bukavu, Sud Kivu, Kamere is the leader of the Union for the Congolese Nation Opposition Party and currently serves as the Minister of Economy in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Kamere's political journey began in the 1980s when he joined the Union pour la Démocratie et le Progrès Social. He actively participated in opposition movements under Mobutu's regime and held positions in various public offices. Under Laurent Kabila's rule, Kamere took on roles within the government, such as Director of the Service National and Finance Counselor at the Ministry of Defense. He also played a significant part in the peace process in the Great Lakes region, earning him the nickname Le Pacificateur, the Peacemaker. In 2004, Kamere became a key figure in Joseph Kabila's election campaign and later assumed the position of President of the National Assembly in 2006. However, his tenure was marked by by questioning Kabila's actions, particularly related to military operations with Rwandan troops in the Congo, leading to his resignation in 2009. In 2010, Kamere left Kabila's PPRD party and launched his bid for the presidency in the 2011 election. He founded the UNC, gaining 7.74% of the vote in the presidential race. In 2018, Kamere threw his support behind Felix Chisikedi's presidential candidacy, forming an alliance with the Union for Democracy and Social Progress. After Chisikedi's election victory, Kamere became his chief of staff in 2019. However, Kamere's political career took a dramatic turn in April 2020 when he was arrested on charges of corruption and embezzlement of over $48 million in public funds. The allegations centered around misappropriating funds intended for housing projects for the military and police, part of a program initiated by President Shisekedi. In a historic verdict, Kamere was found guilty on June 20, 2020, and sentenced to 20 years of forced labor, along with a 10-year ban from public office. Office. This marked the first time in the Democratic Republic of the Congo's history that a high-level politician was convicted of corruption. While incarcerated in Makela prison, Kamerhi's political influence remained intact as he continued to serve as President Shisekedi's chief of staff. However, the twists in Kamerhi's legal journey did not end there. In December 2021, he was provisionally released. Then, on June 23, 2022, a significant turn of events occurred as Kamerhi was acquitted by the Kinshasa Gombe Court of Appeal. The lack of sufficient evidence led to his exoneration, and he was pictured enjoying his newfound freedom with family and friends. Following his acquittal, Kamere's political career experienced a resurgence. On March 25, 2023, he was appointed as the Vice Prime Minister and Minister of the Economy in the new government, known as Sama II, Atik Ahmed. Atik Ahmed was a notorious Indian gangster and politician who left a legacy of crime and controversy that culminated in his assassination on April 15, 2023. Born in 1962 to a humble family in Prayagraj, his journey through life was marked by a series of criminal activities and a foray into politics that defied conventional norms. Ahmed's criminal career began with petty theft, including stealing coal from trains to make a quick profit. Over time, he graduated to more serious criminal activities, such as extorting contractors involved in government tenders for railway scrap metal. His criminal record dates back to 1979, when he was accused of murder in Allahabad, marking the beginning of his criminal notoriety. One significant turning point in Ahmed's criminal life occurred in 1990 when his main competitor, Shaukati Lahi, was eliminated. This event catapulted Ahmed into a position of immense power, and he became known for engaging in extortion, kidnappings, and even murder. One of the most high-profile cases associated with ATIQ Ahmed was the 2005 murder of his political rival, Raju Paul. Ahmed was named as the main accused in this case, but managed to secure bail, maintaining his underworld influence even from behind bars. In another alarming incident, Ahmed and his associates were involved in a violent assault on staff members of Sam Higginbottom University of Agriculture, Technology and Sciences in 2016. A widely circulated video showed Ahmed brutally assaulting university employees, claiming it was in response to the unfair treatment of two students caught cheating. Ahmed's notoriety continued to grow. However, his most infamous crime was the kidnapping of Umesh Pal, a key witness who testified against him in the Raju Pal murder case. In 2009, Ahmed was convicted of this heinous crime. Tragically, on February 24, 2023, Umesh Pal was killed in a shooting and bomb attack, with Ahmed suspected as the main perpetrator. This further solidified Ahmed's reputation as a dangerous criminal figure. Ahmed's political career was also marked by controversy. He entered politics in 1989, winning a seat 
seat as an independent MLA in Allahabad West. He continued to hold political positions as an MLA for several terms, switching between parties, including the Samajwadi Party and Apna Dal. In 2004, Ahmed was elected as a Lok Sabha member of parliament for Fulpur, resigning from his MLA seat. However, his political journey was marred by controversies. He was expelled from the SP in 2007 after providing protection to individuals accused of rape in a madrasa, causing public outrage. Despite facing numerous criminal charges, he contested elections from jail, raising questions about the state of law and order in the region. Despite his criminal record and legal troubles, Ahmed continued to participate in elections, including running as an independent candidate against Prime Minister Narendra Modi in the Varanasi constituency in 2019. However, the end of Atik Ahmed's tumultuous journey came on April 15, 2023, when he was assassinated by three gunmen while being escorted for a court-mandated medical checkup. The attackers posed as media personnel and executed Ahmed and his brother Ashraf Ahmed in the presence of police officers. Sajan Kumar Born on September 23, 1945, Sajan Kumar was associated with the Indian National Congress and represented the Outer Delhi constituency in the Lok Sabha, the lower house of India's parliament. However, his political career took a dramatic turn when he was convicted and sentenced to life imprisonment in connection with the 1984 anti-Sikh riots. Kumar's entry into politics can be traced back to 1977 when he became a Delhi councillor. He managed to secure a seat in the Municipal Corporation of Delhi at a time when few Congress candidates were successful in Delhi. His political ascent continued as he was appointed General Secretary of the Pradesh Congress Committee Delhi. In 1980, Kumar was elected to the 7th Lok Sabha and became a member of the Consultative Committee, Ministry of Works and Housing. During this period, he was known as a loyalist to Sanjay Gandhi, a prominent political figure of that time. Kumar's electoral success continued in 1991 and 2004, with the latter marking a significant achievement as he won by the largest margin of votes ever recorded in India. 855,543. He represented the Indian National Congress in Outer Delhi and served on important parliamentary committees. However, Kumar's political career was marred by his alleged involvement in the 1984 anti-Sikh riots, one of the most horrific incidents in Indian history. Investigations by organizations like the People's Union for Democratic Rights and the People's Union for Civil Liberties suggested that the attacks on the Sikh community during the riots were not spontaneous, but the result of deliberate planning by politicians from the Indian National Congress. Sajjan Kumar was prominently named as one of the key figures responsible for the violence, especially in areas like Sultanpuri and Mangalpuri. In 2010, the Central Bureau of Investigation initiated an investigation into Kumar's role in the riots. Eyewitnesses testified that he colluded with the police and incited mobs to target Sikhs. The CBI alleged that he had organized the anti-Sikh riots and was being tried for killing six Sikhs. Despite his initial acquittal in 2013 by a district court, protests erupted and the Delhi High Court accepted an appeal by the CBI against his acquittal in 2013. The High Court found that the trial court had erred in acquitting him and stated that he had instigated the mob during the riots. Finally, in December 2018, Sajan Kumar was sentenced to life imprisonment by the Delhi High Court for his role in the 1984 anti-Sikh riots. Following his conviction, he resigned from the Indian National Congress. Kumar's attempts to secure bail on medical grounds were rejected by the Supreme Court, ensuring that he remained behind bars. In a recent development, Kumar was acquitted in a case related to the murder of a Sikh man during the 1984 anti-Sikh riots. The court cited the benefit of the doubt in his favor, leading to strong reactions from the Sikh community and political leaders. Sajan Kumar's life and political career continued to evoke strong emotions and demands for justice in India. Alexei Navalny Next, we have Alexei Navalny, a prominent Russian opposition leader, lawyer, and anti-corruption activist who has been at the center of numerous legal battles and controversies in recent years. Born on June 4, 1976, Navalny has consistently advocated for political reforms in Russia, often targeting corruption within the government led by President Vladimir Putin. Navalny's activism has taken various forms, including organizing anti-government protests, running for political office, and using social media to expose corruption in Russia. His efforts have earned him recognition from organizations like Amnesty International, which designated him as a prisoner of conscience. In addition, he was awarded the Sakharov Prize for his work in promoting human rights. One of the key aspects of Navalny's legal battles revolves around criminal cases that have been widely criticized as politically motivated. In 2013, he faced charges of embezzlement related to his alleged involvement in stealing timber from a state-owned company in Kirov Oblast. Despite being sentenced to five years in jail, he was released the next 
next day due to an appeal. Later, the European Court of Human Rights ruled that his trial had violated his right to a fair trial. Navalny also faced legal troubles in a case involving Yves Rocher, where he was accused of embezzling money through a non-profit organization. He received a suspended sentence in 2014, but the European Court of Human Rights later ruled that his conviction was unfair. In August 2020, Navalny made international headlines when he fell seriously ill after being poisoned with a nerve agent known as Novichok. He accused Putin of being behind the poisoning, and investigations implicated Russian security agents. After recovering in Germany, he returned to Russia in January 2021, only to be immediately detained for violating parole conditions related to his previous convictions. Following his return, Navalny's arrest and the release of a documentary accusing Putin of corruption sparked mass protests across Russia. He was subsequently sentenced to over two and a half years in prison in February 2021. Furthermore, his organizations were labeled as extremist and dissolved. In March 2022, Navalny faced additional legal troubles when he was sentenced to an additional nine years in prison, this time for charges of embezzlement and contempt of court. Amnesty International decried this trial as a sham. By August 2023, Navalny had received yet another heavy prison sentence, this time an additional 19 years on charges of inciting extremist activity and rehabilitating Nazi ideology. In the end, we can say that Alexei Navalny's journey from an anti-corruption activist to a prisoner with multiple convictions is marked by allegations of politically motivated trials and persecution by the Russian government. His relentless efforts to challenge corruption and advocate for political change have come at a significant personal cost, leading to a life sentence in a high-security prison. Radovan Karadzic up next we have Radovan Karadzic, a Bosnian Serb political leader and former psychiatrist who faced a dramatic downfall due to his involvement in horrific crimes during the Bosnian War. Born in 1945, Karadzic co-founded the Serb Democratic Party in Bosnia and Herzegovina and served as the first president of Republika Srpska from 1992 to 1996. He also held a dubious title as a war criminal convicted of genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crimes by the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. Karadzic's descent into infamy began when he assumed power during the Bosnian War. He played a significant role in establishing Serb autonomous regions throughout Bosnia-Herzegovina and led the charge for the creation of the Republic of the Serb people of Bosnia and Herzegovina. This move aimed to keep Bosnian Serbs aligned with Yugoslavia if Bosnia and Herzegovina seceded. It marked the beginning of a brutal period in the region's history. Under Karadzic's leadership, Bosnian Serb forces initiated the siege of Sarajevo and were accused of targeting civilians. Moreover, he was charged with ordering the Srebrenica genocide in 1995, which saw thousands of Bosniak, Muslim men and boys, systematically killed. Karadzic faced further accusations, including taking UN personnel hostage and orchestrating campaigns of persecution, extermination, and inhumane acts. Despite being indicted for these heinous crimes, Karadzic managed to evade capture for over a decade, leading to rumors of international protection. He even hid in plain sight, masquerading as a practitioner of alternative medicine under the alias D.D. David. During this time, he lectured on subjects like human quantum energy and maintained a website offering treatments for sexual problems. In 2008, Karadzic's life on the run came to an end when he was arrested in Belgrade. He was transferred to The Hague, where the ICTY took custody of him, and he faced 11 charges related to his alleged war crimes and crimes against humanity. During his trial, Karadzic refused to enter a plea, expressing conspiracy theories and criticizing the tribunal. Nonetheless, the court entered a plea of not guilty on his behalf. His trial was marked by numerous legal motions and delays. In the end, on March 24, 2016, Karadzic was found guilty of genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. He received a 40-year prison sentence, primarily for his role in the Srebrenica massacre and other acts of violence committed during the Bosnian War. However, his legal battle didn't end there. Karadzic filed an appeal, hoping to overturn his conviction. Unfortunately for him, on March 20, 2019, the appeals chamber rejected his appeal and increased his sentence to life imprisonment. In May 2021, it was announced that Karadzic would serve the remainder of his life sentence in a British prison. This marked the end of a long and dark chapter in his life, symbolizing the international community's commitment to holding individuals accountable for crimes against humanity. Aung San Suu Kyi 
Aung San Suu Kyi, born on June 19, 1945, in Rangoon, British Burma, is a Burmese politician who played a significant role in Myanmar's transition from a military junta to a partial democracy in the 2010s. She is the daughter of Aung San, often referred to as the father of the nation of modern-day Myanmar. Suu Kyi's life has been marked by political activism, house arrest, and controversies. Suu Kyi's political journey began after her education in India and the United Kingdom. She worked at the United Nations for three years and later married Michael. Michael Aris, with whom she had two children. However, her life took a dramatic turn during the 8,888 uprising in 1988, when she became the General Secretary of the National League for Democracy, a political party she helped found. In the 1990 elections, the NLD won a significant majority of seats in Parliament, but the military government, known as the State Peace and Development Council, refused to transfer power. Su Ki, who had been detained prior to the elections, spent nearly 15 out of 21 years under house arrest. During this time, she she became one of the world's most prominent political prisoners. Su Kyi's resilience and dedication to nonviolence earned her international recognition, and in 1991 she was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. She survived an assassination attempt during the 2003 De Payan massacre, which claimed the lives of many NLD members. In the 2010 elections, Su Kyi's party boycotted, leading to a victory for the military-backed Union Solidarity and Development Party. However, in the 2012 by-elections, the NLD won a significant number of seats, marking a resurgence. In the 2015 elections, the NLD achieved a landslide victory, but Su Kyi was ineligible to become president due to a constitutional clause as her family held foreign citizenship. Instead, she assumed the role of state councillor, akin to a prime minister. Su Kyi's tenure as state councillor faced criticism for her handling of the Rohingya crisis in Rakhine State, where Myanmar's military faced allegations of committing atrocities. In 2019, she defended the military against allegations of genocide against the Rohingya at the International Court of Justice. However, her political career took a dark turn in February 2021 when the military, known as the Tatmada, staged a coup arresting Su Kyi. She faced multiple charges, including corruption and violating natural disaster management laws by interacting with crowds during the COVID-19 pandemic. The international community widely condemned her arrest and subsequent trials, viewing them as politically motivated. In December 2022, Su Kyi received a cumulative sentence of 33 years in prison, later reduced to 27 years. Her arrest and imprisonment sparked protests across Myanmar and global condemnation. Despite her past as a symbol of democracy and peace, her involvement in Myanmar's government led to a dramatic fall from grace, with her legacy forever entwined with controversy and political upheaval. Park Gun Hai. Park Geun-hye, South Korea's first female president, ascended to power in 2013, carrying the weight of her political lineage as the daughter of Park Chung-hee, a former president who held power for five consecutive terms. Her presidency, however, would be marked by a dramatic downfall, ultimately leading to her impeachment and imprisonment due to her involvement in a colossal corruption scandal. Before her presidency, Park Geun-hye played a pivotal role within South Korea's political landscape. She held leadership positions in the conservative Grand National Party from 2004 to 2006 and later in the Liberty Korea Party from 2011 to 2012. Her political journey also saw her serve as a member of the National Assembly for four consecutive terms, spanning from 1998 to 2012. In 2012, she embarked on her fifth term as a representative elected via the National List. Park's historical significance as South Korea's first female president added to her political legacy, but her familial connection to her father, Park Chung-hee, also contributed to her unique position in the country's political landscape. However, her president presidency would take a dark turn due to her association with Choi Soon-sil, a close confidant who held no official government position but wielded substantial influence over Park. The scandal erupted when it was revealed that Choi Soon-sil had exploited her position to solicit substantial monetary donations from major South Korean business conglomerates, including Samsung, Hyundai, SK Group, and Lata. These donations were directed toward two foundations under Choi's control, leading to allegations of extortion. Choi was also accused of directly interfering with government policies and even editing Park's presidential speeches. The scandal sent shockwaves across South Korea, triggering widespread protests demanding Park's resignation. Her approval ratings plummeted to an all-time low, reaching as low as 4%. Despite offering multiple apologies and proposing to let the National Assembly decide her departure, Park faced rejection from the opposition-controlled legislature. The pressure from public protests and mounting allegations ultimately led to Park's impeachment by the National Assembly under 
December 9, 2016, a decisive 234 out of 300 members voted in favor of her impeachment, surpassing the necessary two-thirds majority. Consequently, her presidential powers were suspended. On March 10, 2017, the Constitutional Court of Korea issued a unanimous 8-0 ruling, confirming Park's impeachment and officially terminating her presidency. This historic decision made her the first sitting South Korean president to be removed from office since the country's democratization. Park Goinhee's legal troubles extended beyond her impeachment. On April 6, 2018, she was sentenced to 24 years in prison after being found guilty of multiple charges, including abuse of power and coercion. Subsequently, this sentence was raised to 25 years, and she was also fined 20 billion South Korean won, approximately $17.86 million, following an appeal by prosecutors. Her legal woes did not end there. Additional criminal cases resulted in further prison time. Notably, she was convicted of illegally obtaining off-the-book funds from the National Intelligence Service and interfering in the Sunuri Party primaries during the 2016 South Korean legislative election. These convictions added seven more years to her prison sentence. However, in an unexpected turn of events, Park gun hye received a pardon on compassionate grounds from South Korean President Moon Jae-in in December 2021. She was released from prison on December 31, 2021, and returned home in March 2022, marking the conclusion of a tumultuous chapter in South Korean political history. This was all about the corrupt politicians jailed for their actions. Thank you for staying with us. If you enjoy our content, our newest videos are just a click away.